Hello again. Welcome to another episode of Sermon B-Sides. My name is Rustin, and I'm one of the pastors at Quorum Deo Church, and I'm here with Pastor John. Um, The whole idea behind these B-Side episodes that we put together is to have fun conversations, to dig deep into the riches of God's Word. What happens is that we preach a sermon and you can only fit so much into what? How many, how many minutes is the sermon time frame we're trying to aim for, John? Well, it's like 30, but it like usually is 30 and then 35 and then 40 by the 11 because there's no time restrictions. Exactly. <laughs> so there's a challenge, right? Because yes. God's word is inexhaustible. And when you herald God's word to God's people, you have a finite moment to do so. <laughs> Absolutely. And so uh, the whole point of these sermon B-sides is that John and I have had conversations on the side over the years, in between sermons, in between, out in the foyer of our church, talking about, oh, there's, there's this angle. And it's like, I know I couldn't fit it though. So the whole point of this is to have a, a conversation, an enjoyable conversation that delights in God's word, uh, that's friendship. And what's better with... Uh, friendship than sharing a glass of something delicious what are you drinking amen uh hey by the way real quick, are you in gallery mode right now i am in gallery mode yeah okay I just want to make sure we don't make that error one. again yeah <laughs> uh like, so you, you watch a lot of podcasts and a lot of people you know there's a different philosophy some people do the gallery some people do the individual and it always throws me when i do it the, the other way though i i like the gallery yeah me too that way i can see your face Okay, so I got this bottle of Blackened for my birthday, and uh, it is a blended whiskey, and it's made, and it's, bl- it's whiskeys that have been blended that are blended in a black brandy cask. So I've never tried this. I've never even heard of it. I just opened it, I don't know, eight minutes ago. What, what kind of cask? A black what cask? It's a black brandy cask. Oh. Casks. So yeah. I, I am not a brandy fan but i am a fan of whiskey so i'll tell you this is the first sip ever all right the smell it's smooth doesn't smell super hot all right oh that's nice (laughs) oh that's really nice what kind of nice is that is it like a because you know every time you have a glass of a blended whiskey it's you could go the spectrum is you know yeah to the scotch or irish whiskey or it could be kind of like flirting with the whole bourbon thing this is more flirting with the bourbon thing, oh wow but it's very smooth cool um i guess you could maybe say polite it's not a punch you in the mouth which i prefer punch you in the mouth but this is it's polite super good yeah um it's definitely got a a lingering uh, you can taste the wood from the cask. It definitely has picked up that flavor. Do you get any of that like fruity brandy brandiness in there? I loathe brandy and I like this, so I have to say yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> it does have a little bit. Let me try again here. Yeah, this is nice. It's got a little bit of an apple. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Oh. A little bit of an apple flavor, right? like a green apple, not yeah, okay. not red. It's a, it's like that typical kind of greenish, a little bit of tartness to it. Interesting. That's so. It's kind of like a bourbon that I mean, it's flirts towards the bourbon probably because the woodiness. But then a lot of a lot of like Highland Scotch have that green yeah. apple. Look. So it's got a little bit of a hybrid. That's kind of fun. I kind yeah. of try. But the wood bit. note just it's still there. It just hangs out on your tongue. It's really nice. So. Cool. I won't say who gave this to me, but thank you to whoever gave this to me. Okay. Next time we're together, let's, I, w- I want to try some of that. That's nice. All right. So I'm trying a little bit of a, a, uh, a special classic. This is the uh, Basil Hayden's uh, Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. It's a high rye bourbon. And it's the, uh, I, at first I thought it was the rye because I think they have a dark rye that looks like this. Okay. I, I think, I think, I don't remember who gave, I think it, Brenna gave this to me. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> It was one of those like gifts I got, like, you know, every birthday I asked for bourbon. So I ended up getting a couple from, uh, from uh, people and then uh, Father's Day is right next to that. So I, I, that's, that's when I stopped at my whiskey. <laughs> you, so, you do well. 
Yeah, so this is the, uh, it's not the dark rye, it's the, uh, the ex, the, I think the artfully aged Basil Hayden. So it's aged for 10 years, um, but it's, it's definitely darker than the standard uh, Basil Hayden. Excellent. And uh, Basil Hayden's great. I, one of the things that always throws me is that they bottle at 40%, whereas most whiskeys are bottled 43 and up, you know? So, yeah. So, but still awesome 40 percent is that's like almost like a like a imperial like double ipa yeah <laughs> yeah exactly i mean it's, it's definitely low for a whiskey but it's you know basil hayden's been around doing amazing things for a long time and they're not they're not a you know they're not a low shelf by any means so i get a little bit of green apple on this one too yeah well wise i'm i'm getting the slow burn right now and i'm really liking it. it's like delayed this is in, this is so this is like the bourbon that kind of wants to be Jameson. <laughs> it's definitely okay. dark wood, uh, dark wood aged well bourbon. But I think because it's not at that higher percentage and it has that green apple note, it reminds me a little bit of Jameson. Huh. And, and there's probably people who hear me say this be like, what, are you kidding me? He doesn't know what he's doing, he's talking about, but. They're I, offended. Yeah, that's just what I think. <laughs> I gotta pour some more. This is really good. Mm. This is that's probably dangerous definitely, because definitely caramely, definitely. Uh, it doesn't taste like green apple. It smells like green apple. So, all right, all right. Maybe I'm just thinking green apple because you said green apple, but that just it just hit me. So, okay. all right. So, anyways, we're in a new sermon series. And yes, sir. We're, and as, as, while we're recording this, we're actually, we've just finished with the, the, the third word in our, word, in our series on the 10 words. Yep. Which is a series going through the 10 commandments. So my first question to you is, so why did you want to take the church through the 10 commandments? That was something that I think you talked about earlier in the year. Mm. And it became, it, it, I, in conversations that we had, it, it almost felt like, uh, there were added reasons for why going through the Ten Commandments seemed so fitting and proper and almost urgent. <laughs> yeah. So Did before I get into that, that, yeah. If for those of you who are watching, um, like and share this. We yeah. want to put resources out that are helpful to the church. I know there's people who watch this that are outside of Quorum, that are outside of our state. And so, just a reminder: like it and share it. We appreciate it. It gets the word out. So, okay. The question. Yes. Why? Why? The Ten Commandments, why the Decalogue now? So you know there was a little bit of talk um, probably in the spring about potentially doing Acts instead of the Ten yes. Commandments. So there was kind of two driving forces that led me to think we need to do this like at this time. So the first was, um, which I think we'll get into, is the uprise of Marcionism. Mm. and um and so two years ago andy stanley released a book called irresistible mm. and um <laughs> I, I i read the whole book it was hard because there there were things you that read were the whole book i did read i don't usually read a whole book but i read the book and it was um it was it was painful to say the least and and my hope is that he is a well-intended guy but off off base. So, um, and he's a super influential pastor, at, at least in the United States. I think there's like 40,000 members at his church that, as far as I know, hasn't met for a while. Um, but he writes, he does conferences, he does podcasts and everything. So it's not like some guy in some small town church had this crazy idea. You're talking about a guy with a national platform. Yeah. Um, and and uh, sometimes when you have somebody like that and they say something or they, they write a book, the masses just go, oh, yeah, he said it. It's got to be true. And that book is essentially neo-Marcionism in which he's, you know, he straight out says, thou shalt not obey the Ten Commandments. That is a direct quote from his book. And so I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of people watching might not know what Marcionism is. Yeah. Can we do a little bit of like a drive-by historical theology and just kind of give a quick bullet point on what Marcionism is? Sure, sure. Marcionism, as I understand it, well, Mar is named after Marcion, I yep. don't know, 
the heretic of Snope or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's a first century heretic. Yeah. And he essentially believed, and I think he would, maybe he's got like, ah, can we characterize it as like a hardcore dispensationalism? It seems like there's some, some connections, although they're not the same thing. Maybe that's not a good connection. So one, of, that for now. one of my concerns with some of the, some dispensationalistic uh, practices and approaches to scripture seems like it goes down a Marcion rabbit hole. Um, though I wouldn't want to, offend my faithful dispensationalist brothers who are who would not i would not be categorized as marxian but it absolutely i feel like i feel like uh dispensationalism leans if it's a tree it's leaning towards marxianism so in yeah. some, a lot of its applications yeah so he was a first century heretic and he essentially be believed um that the god of the old testament is different than the god of the new testament yeah. And that the the New Test or the Old Testament had no place uh, for uh, in the New Testament church. And I, I mean, I don't know if he is he would would he go as far as saying it is a different God? He's not like he's not a pluralist in that sense or a. Um, what I have studied of Marcion is that he uh, he did kind of perpetuate that idea of the Old Testament. Uh, fitting in line with that Greek understanding of the demiurge, the, and meaning like, like that Gnostic, there's a spiritual reality that's yeah. uh, the, uh, given to us in the New Testament that contrasts with the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was, is ultimately uh, polluted in that, in that it's, and so there's like a dualism. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 the last place I read on it did talk about Marcin refer, uh, referring to him, or at least speaking about the God of the Old Testament in the same school of thought as the Greeks, and I think referring to him as the demiurge, the like okay. the sub God. Okay. Yeah. So there's a there's a very clear distinction. The the God uh, who Christ reveals to us in the New Testament is different than the God we see in the Old Testament, and consequently, the Old Testament scriptures have no place in the life of of a a new covenant believer. Yes, yes. So that's that's the heresy of, of Marcionism. And I think that actually one of the first discussions of canon, like which Bible should, which, which, which what, what books make up the Bible, one of the first discussions in the first century was Marcion basically trying to boot, boot out all the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's huge, huge, huge problems with that. Um, yes. <laughs> that we'll hopefully get to talk about a little bit a little bit more here but what is it what, 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 can, I, can i interject real quick yeah it's really interesting in andy stanley's book one of his motives um for for kind of unhitching a, a you know christian orthodox faith from the old testament is now christians don't have to answer all those objections from the old testament because that was then and this is now that's one of his it's like an apologetic basically yeah and but but what's wrapped into there is the assumption that christians should be embarrassed by the things god did in the old testament which is absolutely absurd <laughs> yes yes i think that I, I i can understand that motivation i mean me, meaning i see that motivation in so much christian teaching and preaching yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to name some names of people that I've, you know, that that are not as so Andy Stanley, you bring up Andy Stanley because he's kind of in the camp of yeah. uh, evangelicalism. He's in the uh, camp of uh, what you would consider to be orthodoxy mm -hmm. uh, as a Protestant. But, you know, on the on the fringes, you have uh, I mean, it feels like there's a new book every every year that is uh, attacking the Old Testament. Um, and I, I'm thinking about, I don't know if you're familiar with Rachel Held Evans, but yeah. she has the book, uh, you know, and she passed away sadly, but she had the book, uh, A Year of Biblical Womanhood, which basically mm. takes a very satiristic, uh, mocking understanding of the law of God in the Old Testament, the covenant law, and uh, basically takes it and, um, and makes fun of it through living it out in, in, in present day, which is just absurd considering the progressive reality of, of, of God's revelation. And then you have, you know, I think, was it two years ago, Rob Bell put out his, you know, what is the Bible? How an ancient huh. 
library of poems, letters, and stories can transform the way you think and feel about everything, which basically he spends the whole book just kind of saying that, you know, forget the Bible, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I think there's also, um, th what I'm going to say is not in the same camp as what you just said, yeah, but yeah. a lot of times when it comes to, especially like the creation story, yeah, I feel like that gets hijacked by A&E guys who want to reinterpret everything through ancient Near East yeah. culture, mythology, all of that. And it's like, and part of what that does is it, um, I feel like sometimes what they're trying to do is, is to say, hey, don't take this stuff literally. Mm -hmm. Like the authors didn't intend that. And once you do that, then now you don't have to defend, you know, apologetically defend any of these you know, things that are in the Old Testament that, that conventional wisdom in, in like secular culture would push, a, push against. You have, I mean, I, yeah, you have there John, John Walton, who I think has written some very good things, but who kind of seems like he operates from a stance of embarrassment. Or yeah. I don't want this, these things to come, on, come up in the arguments like, yeah. you know, six days is irrelevant. But God said six days, and I, the, I it's think it's not like, irrelevant when you get to the fourth commandment. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, and then I mean, it reminds me. I think we, when me and you and I we went and saw John Walton, who uh, came and did a, a kind of his talk at a, a, a local church around here. And one of the things that kind of comes up is that for for personally is that okay, so God wants you to teach your kids the words of the Bible, right? Yeah. Yep. He wants you to teach your kids what his word says. And there's a kind of, uh, there's a kind of at bringing this so high up in the academy that, oh, this isn't really what it means, that you forget yeah. that every single Hebrew father and Christian father probably walks their kids through. These are the days of creation. You yeah. know, the, and, and is that just are we being taught to lie to our kids because the language says yeah. it? You know, like to me, that's just, that's yeah. just disturbing. This yeah. idea that there's the, the, um, <laughs> the pedagogy of teaching is undermined by this notion. And you're, it's almost like in some ways uh, teaching your kid a myth instead of teaching them, this is, this is God's word and right. believe it and obey it. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you have, and you have uh, ends, ends as well, uh, who wrote Inspiration and Incarnation. There's, there's just a lot of literature right now, a lot of different angles on what seems to be coming from an embarrassment with the Old Testament. Yeah. An embarrassment with who God reveals himself to be. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah, oh, and I was going to say, specifically in, in Stanley's book, um, I think... Um, I think that there's a, a mistake that he makes, and I don't know if he knows he's making it or not, but I think he makes a big mistake. Well, there's multiple mistakes, but there's one huge mistake. When he says the old covenant is obsolete, what he means by that, he, he, go, he, he conflates the old covenant and the old Testament as if the old Testament is the old covenant yeah. rather than the old Testament contains the old covenant yeah, so yeah. that we can say the old covenant right, has, is done, and we're in the new covenant, but that doesn't at all mean the Old Testament is done, because Paul tells us that, you know, all the words are inspired, they come from God, that they're profitable, when, excuse me, I dropped my pen, when, when Paul says it's profitable for teaching and correcting and rebuking, he's talking about the Old Testament, when he tells yes. Timothy that by these, by these scriptures, you're able to be able to come um, wise unto salvation, Yep. He's talking about the Old Testament. When Jesus talks with the disciples about the law and the prophets, they're about me. That's all about the Old Testament. None of the New Testament authors act or write as if the Old Testament is obsolete. The Old Covenant has been supplanted by the New Covenant, yep. for sure. But yep. that doesn't mean that the Old Testament is obsolete. And I think that's a distinction that Stanley doesn't make or he misses or maybe he doesn't understand it. But it's really dangerous when you conflate that the old Testament or the old covenant has been replaced. And so therefore the old Testament has been replaced. That's just simply not true. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you even have, you know, when, 
when you bring up the fact that when Paul talks to Timothy about, you know, the 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 scriptures are are God breathed and profitable for. Yep. He also says for teaching in righteousness. Yes. Right? Yeah. And for teaching in righteousness, that's legal terms. Right. Meaning he's also telling Timothy that the law and the righteousness declared by the the old because he would he, he would have been talking specifically about the Old Testament because the New Testament canon was not even disseminated yet. Yeah. Right. And so, right. so he's, he wouldn't have been thinking about anything other than the Old Testament. And when you think righteousness, you would have thought, what does God's justice have to say about, what does God say about justice? And yeah. so he's saying, if you want to know what justice is, you can go to the Old Testament and find out, right? Yeah. So um, if, if God is just, then his laws are just. Yes. And if God is righteous then his laws are righteous. And if God is merciful and loving, then his laws are merciful and loving. And I think there is that embarrassment factor when you look at, when you have a theocracy and there are civil laws, like God is not overreacting to sin. We are underreacting to sin, but the, the law and the codes, they show us what righteousness looks like. Yeah. That God hasn't changed. <laughs> yes. yes. You, now you brought up an interesting word there that I think is kind of buzzing, will buzz in people's words. You use the word theocracy, oh, right? Yeah. Yeah. So one of, one, of the, one of the questions I have is why do you think, because I, I, I think that these two things are connected, okay, this criticism to being somewhat Marcion and anti-Old Testament, okay? Why do you think that there's this gut reaction against theocracy? Um, and is, it, is there something well-placed about that gut, gut reaction and, or, or something that's understood about it and something that's misunderstood? I mean, wh why do you think there, when people, when people use the word theocracy and even like, even, I, I think that most Christians that really love their Bible and love the word would love a theocracy if it, if it's you know if it's god ruling right so, yeah but what's the what's the buzz against uh theocracy Are, do you mean theonomy or theocracy i mean the, I, i'm 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 talking about, i mean theonomy is a whole another bag of uh we could talk about that at a different time but yeah. um it's related but no theocracy so yeah. theocracy is god ruling yes in a formal organized so israel um, when they are in the promised land, right, are a, are a theocracy, meaning that the laws, the civic laws, not just a moral code, which would be, you know, which would be clearly seen in the Ten Commandments, but we're talking about how are disputes settled, right, yeah. between neighbors or offending parties. Um, so when God is dictating that and determining that, and that is handed down, and, and essentially God is king over, you know, over a people that's that's essentially what we're talking about with a theocracy yeah and um and i think it's very similar to uh the issue with theonomy yeah. is that everybody wants a theocracy the question is which gods which theo. which laws yeah which yeah. which theo yeah. Uh, yeah and and so um and i think it, it leans into that embarrassment thing like yeah. god's god is the only right and true king <laughs> yes right and, yes. And, and it's it shouldn't be an embarrassment and i think a lot what um what i hear at least is that um the laws and punitive like judgments against sins that are also crimes um is excessive in the old testament god is is seen to be harsh right yeah. And that's probably, and that, and that comes from a culture, from our culture, yes. that kills thousands of children, unborn children, every day. And we look at God's law and we go, oh, he's harsh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I just, I just, by the way, I just watched uh, The Giver by Lois Lowry. Yes. And, and you have in there a whole society built upon the elimination of, of, of people uh, whenever they're not useful for the community anymore. And yep. it, the, it was, it, it's this, it's a picture of this whole world being made in the image of man 
uh, right? And so, I, I, you know, I watched that and I thought, man, this is in some ways so much what we're, we're living in right now. There is yeah. definitely a, uh, a, a harshness to the gods we worship that enslave, enslave us and, th- and make us think that there's no other way, right? Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I, I think that some of the gut reaction against theocracy is really a gut reaction against ecclesiocracy. Mm. Right? Like not wanting, uh, and I think that, I think that a person who really thinks that theocracy is good doesn't want an ecclesiocracy either. <laughs> Like, like, uh, like there's a specific role that the church plays. Yeah. I think a true theocracy just acknowledges a reality that is already present, that God truly is reigning. Yeah. Yeah. uh, And that his laws truly are good. And, and there's a sense in which, so the, the, the question of theonomy, which is, has to do more with God's law, right? Um, Should God's law be, the law that we use to govern ourselves and there's questions there but because of context has changed right like yeah, yeah. but but I, I i do believe that god's law does give us the the uh, god's principles for what true justice is yeah the, the, the rules around restitution the you know and all, all these different things about what makes just justice just i think that now, some people want to criticize people who are, uh, who think that, you know, who might lean towards the army as they just want to, you know, they want to institute all these crazy laws, right? Uh, about, you know, cer- the ceremonial law or, you know, like there's certain, yeah. you can't, you have to go, you're unclean when you, you know, et cetera. There's, there's some interesting things we could read <laughs> that make you unclean, right? Well, yeah. that, that's a total mis mis misunderstanding because it take doesn't take into account the progressive revelation and the yes. fact that christ fulfilled the law right yeah. yeah and so when christ fulfilled the law i think everybody so many people hear that and think oh christ really abolished the law right 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 <laughs> so there's a there's got to be a difference between christ fulfilling the law and christ abolishing the law and i think that that you know, the ceremonial stuff that some people think are is outlandish and strange. And why would you want to make that part of your law? You're forgetting that there are different governments at play in the institution of God's people. You have civil governments. You yeah. Have, okay. So we have a uh, family government, church government. Yep. And civil government. Yeah. The word government never used to be said without a modifier. Yeah. Right. And right. so the, right. civil, the, the it, it, you, you see a very similar thing happening in, in God's law. You have these different areas of governance, right? The ceremonial governments had to do with religious, religious, uh, and cult, the, the, the cult of God's people, the actual practices of the temple and, 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 and whatnot, and yeah. how yeah. those are obsolete when the fulfillment of those things comes of all the pe- temple and, and practices in the priesthood, we're all pointing towards something that was coming yeah. right? in Christ, then the, those things are undone are, 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 are obsolete, but they're not, but they're not useless. They're, they're not useless. They're still yeah. profitable because yeah. they actually help us understand the purity and the, and the holiness of Jesus. Yeah. And I, yeah. I was just going to say as a side note, um, It's really interesting that on the one hand, people will object to like dietary laws in the Old Testament. And then on the other hand, if you run into a CrossFit person who just discovered keto. I know, right? Yes. Yes. You're like, what? That sounds. (laughs) Or, 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 or gluten intolerance. I mean, yes, there's, there's a, there's a dietary law that is, is becoming more and more practiced. Yeah. Um, So, so this is kind of touching. This is the second uh, answer to the question you asked. So yeah. why the, why the 10 commandments? Yes. The first one was Marcionism, but what we're also, also, I think, you know, getting around to is that um, we're living in this, you know, something I've never witnessed in my lifetime. And that is just utter chaos. Um, you have utter chaos at every level. And, you know, the S- Seattle, uh, for those of you who are watching in is an hour ferry ride away from where we're at. It's probably a half hour from where Rustin's at. And um, man, I love, would love going to Seattle for food and for drinks and for concerts and for sporting events. And Seattle is an absolute mess. And I, I won't even go there. It, it's just, there's no law. 
and there's chaos, um, there's crime, and you you know we had the uh, the whole what was it the Capitol Hill autonomy zone, and it got changed to something else. Or I'm like, how is it that people are taking over entire blocks of a city, and law enforcement can do nothing? Their hands are tied, and so you're seeing that pop up. You know our our stepsister to the south in Portland, I think still has a camp that's, that's there. There's crazy stuff going on everywhere. Nobody knows what a male or a woman or a female, I mean, it's just like, you're seeing total and utter chaos. And simultaneously, you're seeing governors abuse their power, yeah. um, over, overreaching mandates, guidelines, arbitrary, um, you know, declarations and, and I was just feeling like we, we got to have this foundation of law because what we're, what we're witnessing is just rampant lawlessness. And so we need as a church to be grounded back into the objective, objective truth of God's law. And what we're seeing right now, and sometimes we'll, we'll say this in sermons is that you either have Christ as Lord and a world ordered after his law, or you have chaos. And when you're, when you're, you know, when Christendom is in the rearview mirror and you're coming out of that, you still have a semblance of order and assumed uh, normalities and whatnot. But the further you get away from Christianity, you know, whether that is authentically, professed and confessed or people just buy into it, it, it still brings a measure of order yes. and righteousness to a, um, to a, to a society. And so the further you get away from that, it is absolutely inescapable. It's an inevitable reality that you will tailspin into chaos because if this, you know, if the world came from nothing and one thing can become anything, then anything's permissible. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing right now. And so I felt like we really, we need to be grounded in a, an objective understanding of morality and, and what we're human beings made for. How do we, you know, how does God intend us to live? How do we flourish as human beings? And the law just seemed like the place to go. <laughs> yeah, the, it's one of the things that if you, if you Think lowly of the Old Testament, and then you decide you're not going to actually spend any time reading and studying it. What you're going to miss is how much being a human being means living it and, and, and following God means conflict with a world shaped by idols. Yeah. Right? Yep. And there is this constant theme of God calling his people to not forget him, right? Not forget him. Don't forget the words that I've taught you. Don't, you know, that's what he teaches us to teach our kids, right? When you're, when you're laying down, when you're standing up, when you're walking on the road, don't forget God's word. Don't forget what he has said and, 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 and what he has uh, spoken to us. And what the, the story of the Old Testament is, is, is a story that is all about conflict with these idols. You know, yeah. I'm, reading, I'm reading through Second Kings right now, and it's just it's it's that 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 uh christ or or chaos is firmly on display in the story of the old testament the king god's king or the de-evolution of humanity and dehumanization of humanity because because of the worship of idols right and so the i mean recently i mean there's a there's a king called ahaz right and he and, and, and he's a king of judah i just read this i think it was in second kings 15 or something like that around there. Um, king Ahaz is the king of Judah. His dads or his, you know, the Judah, the, the kings of Judah were more, more often than the kings of Israel were walking faithfully in, 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 in the, in the law of God and, and, and whatnot. But Ahaz turns his back on that. He establishes the high places. He brings the altar from like, he copies the altar that he sees in Syria and he brings it into the house of God and he, he, he kills his son on the altar. He Mm. burns his son. And 
you get this when you go after idols, right? When you start to think of the world through the lens shaped by idols, you don't know the value of your own children. Yeah. <laughs> you yes. don't, you don't see you, they become something that you are willing to sacrifice. And there's multiple ways we do that. We do that through that. Like you mentioned earlier, the, the practice of abortion, but also we do that through the, uh, the sacrificing of their future through not actually teaching them or wanting them to have a, a Christian view of the world. You know, like there's a, there's there, or we support institutions that, that do that. Like there's a whole bunch of ways in which that happens. Uh, But so that's, those are kind of some of the reasons why the old Testament is so important. It gives us this perspective that there is in fact conflict that's happening. And yeah, and that, yeah. com- and that reminds me of James where he says, you know, don't, don't, anyone who's a friend of the world, right, is not a, is an enemy of God. There's, yeah. it's not talking about your neighbor, like, I don't want to be their friend because they don't, they're not believing in God, but it's talking specifically about the principalities, the powers, and the idols that right. control and are, and are worshipped by the world. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So one of the, one of our little notes here for the, this episode was when we think about the law and we come to the first word, right? Which is no other gods before me. Yeah. One of the things that's, that's important to, um, to realize and keep coming back to is that the, the exodus and the liberation, the, the salvation from slavery precedes the giving of the law. So the order is God rescues and God gives his law. Yes. And, and the danger is, is reversing those and go, God gives his law. And if I can meet the standard, then God will rescue me. And that's essentially how the false religion of the world function on that, yes. on that premise. It, what's in the story is God has covenanted himself with a people and he rescues them. And then he gives the law. So our yes. obedience to the law can never be the basis of his loving salvation for us. Yes. So that has to keep running yes. in the background when we're thinking about how we, how we receive and how we hear these laws, because the law is not burdensome in that way. The law, you know, David delighted in the law of the Lord and the law is a gift. And, and you see that coming right out of the gates with the first commandment, which is no other gods. And, you know, you think about what David says in Psalm um, 115 about the issue of idolatry is why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Now, this is the kicker. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. And when God says no other gods, you have to, you have to understand it within this framework of idolatry that the false gods, the idols, they were enslaving. They're enslaving. They, they cannot speak. You think about a person who cannot see, speak. I mean, the picture here is, a, is dehumanization. Yes. And the idols of the nations and our idols rob us of our humanity. And God is the God, Yahweh, who rescues his people out of slavery. The idols of the world push us into slavery yes yeah. and so when god says no other gods it's not because he's insecure he's not like this it's not this middle school junior high you know uh codependent relationship where he's super you know unsure of himself and he's just gonna have a terrible day if we go worship somebody else it's it's his love and his grace to us yes he says this he's like the the gods of this world the false gods idols they enslave you yeah. And um, in, in Lightheart's commentary, I loved it. He, he just boiled, summed it up by saying, idols are stupid and they make us stupid. <laughs> yes. That's a really great like summary of that psalm because that's, a, I mean, that's exactly what it, 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 it gets to is you, I think that uh, 
GK Beale had a book called We Become What We Worship, right? Mm. And just basically that whole book is a, is a study of idolatry in the Bible and how it's, it's this, con- there's a constant theme of what you worship shapes who you are. And um, yes, idolatry leads to blindness, to deafness, to numbness. Yeah. Right? If you're blind, if you're feeling like you're blind, <laughs> blind, deaf, lost, numb in the world, it's probably due to an idol, right? Like yeah. there's a need to, there's a need to um, be woken up, right? But the, the, the crazy thing with that also is that if you're blind, deaf, and dumb, yeah. how can you ever have your eyes open to see the glory of the true God? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. So there's, um, in that first sermon, I went through like a bunch of purposes of the law and we had to take some out. But one of, one of the purposes of the law is what I called missional, couldn't go into, but in a world of numb people because of idolatry, Israel is supposed to be a light to the nations and show them, yes. this is what you were made for. Yes. Right? And so how does that person know that they're numb and they're blind? Well, obviously, you know, the Holy Spirit has to be at work. There has to be re- regeneration. But one of the ways that they see it is they have to see a different vision of humanity. Yeah. And they, they need light. They need to they be need light. And that light always ends up being, I mean, we, 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 we kind of fool ourselves if we think that that light is simply a nice, warm glow that makes us feel cozy, mm-hmm. right? And in some ways, that light is exposing, right? Yes, yeah. That light is, uh, I, I remember, you know, Jesus comes into the world as light, right? That's one of the things that John talks about. But he also says, they, they love the darkness, the world yeah. loved the darkness because of their evil deeds. Yeah. Shun the light love the darkness because of their evil deeds. And then God's people are then told to be light. Yeah. Told to, Paul tells us to expose the darkness, right? Expose the darkness. And there's a real sense in which that's, that's, I think that's honestly what is offensive to people about Christians is that even though we have a darkness because of our own sin that Christ has exposed and we have just received his grace, right? Yep. The fact that we still own that there's light and that his way is right is, yeah. is untenable to the world that loves its darkness. Yeah. So there's, a, there's an unavoidable conflict yes. there. Yeah. And it's really interesting um, that when you have like a front row seat to that in, in Acts, yeah. when the light of Christ and the gospel through the church um, confronts a culture or a society or a, or a city or a people, it often looks like riots. <laughs> yeah. It does look like it, it, it totally, I mean, that's, that's the theme in, uh, <laughs> that's the theme in Acts is they're always getting into trouble. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me also of Deuteronomy and speaking of the old Testament again, right? He's where, where the God's people are told to keep the law. And this, and this is the reason why keep them and do them for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the, in, in the sight of the peoples who will hear, who will hear all these statutes and say, surely, the, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the yeah. Lord. Mm. So there's the, the, there's a direct connection between the loving of God's law, the conflict and the exposing to see for them to see. Yeah. Lord. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the conflict. So I think we, we talked about this in a previous episode, the conflict doesn't come as a result of like the church picking a fight. Yeah. It comes as a result of the church being what it is. Yes. And the fight comes from the other side. It comes from the culture. Yes. Right? Yeah. And um, that co- without that conflict, there is no potential for conversion. Yes. Because if there is no conflict between the church and the world, then people aren't converting to anything. Yes. Right. And it's like, I think that, um, Hmm. This has been one of those unintentional themes to this episode, but you talk about like apologizing for God or being embarrassed of, of things that are in the old Testament. Um, I think one of the lies that church um, 
falls into is that um, if we're dif different than the world, the world will never convert. But the problem is, is if we're not different than the world, the world can't convert because <laughs> there's nothing to convert to. Exactly. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. And I think that, I think that when I think about practical application there, I, I think about my own affections and how, what, what is really behind the embarrassment of God's law, right? What's really yeah. behind that embarrassment? And I think it's honestly, it's twofold. One is that you prize the approval of man rather than God. And two, it's you don't see the beautiful word of God, his law, as as beautiful and delightful as the psalmist says in 119. Yeah. Right? Yep. You, 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 if, if you're in that boat, you need to go and read Psalm 119 and ask yourself, why don't I treasure God's law this, the way that he does, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and there's a real, uh, I think that the reason why I say that is that if you don't actually treasure it, you don't actually treasure it and you just use it as like a bat to like, I have this bat to whack people with, right? But you yeah. see it's beautiful, yeah. and I want to apologize for what's beautiful, then you're going to actually display joy. Yeah. Right? And that joy that we have in the Lord is what is the strength that we have in the midst of that conflict. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's, so I think that that's, uh, that's something that we, we need to commit to is treasuring the Old mm -hmm. Testament. Amen to that. I'm glad, we're, I'm glad we're going through the Ten Commandments. In, 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 in a way, it really opens up all kinds of avenues to thinking about the Old Testament. Yeah, so so we were doing the Ten Commandments. Over the summer, we did the Psalms. And, and then the two years before that, we did Genesis. <laughs> so it, we, and I, I'll just say, I, I know that we're like, we're running, we, we need, this probably needs to be the last thought, but okay. time-wise. But I can honestly say that going through the Psalms, we're, we just got wrapped up our third, our third year of it. Every summer we go through the Psalms. Going through the Psalms has began, begun to produce in me a heart that loves the Old Testament mm. in, in a way I, I hadn't had before, you know? Yeah. And, I, and it's, you know, getting to preach through a good chunk of it makes me realize how there's a whole world shaping power to the Old Testament that helps you understand the glories of Christ when you read the new Testament, that yeah. if you're not soaking in it, in both Testaments, you're going to miss, right? Yeah. So yes. maybe the encouragement there is just, you know, dig into your old Testament. If you have questions about weird stuff, ask the questions, you know, I also want to say, since we're ending here, if you have any questions about anything we said or a sermon that you watched at Coram Deo, feel free to go to slido.com. I put in the code Coram Deo and we can actually uh, answer questions on this as well. So anyways, John, anything you want to say to wrap up? Uh, gosh, I mean, there's lots to say. There is, there's lots of episodes to come. I think, you know, just to piggyback what you said, there's a real danger in trying to have like a theology of Christ. Yes. That is, that has no old Testament. Because what will happen, and I think that's what we're seeing, is that Jesus now is used to solve problems he wasn't intended to solve. Yeah. Rather than being the answer to the, to the question of the Old Testament, he becomes the answer to some other question. And, um, and so it's super important that you, you understand the story, the narrative, what's unfolding. The Old Testament helps us understand why it's good news that Christ is Lord. Absolutely. And it won't make any sense without understanding, you know, the Old Testament. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that, John. Thank you guys for joining us. We are, uh, we love doing these, uh, these B-side episodes. And just want to say, please like, share, ask questions. We love doing this and we'd love uh, to get, you know, your feedback responses and, and get the word out to more people. Amen. Hey, cheers. Yeah.